Well, welcome everybody. If you have a Bible, you can turn to the book of 2 Corinthians. We're going to be in chapters 11 and 12 in just a few minutes. But before we get there, we might as well go ahead and get, get, get this out of the way and take care of business. I don't know what you were doing last week, but this is what I was doing. I was welcoming our very first grandbaby into the world. Indeed, indeed. Uh, this, is, this is baby Virginia Merritt. I got another little picture of her. Uh, this is her, I mean, look at that, my goodness. We could just do this for the next 30 minutes. It would be awesome. Let's just admire her. Virginia Merritt weighed seven pounds, three ounces, born on Monday. And man, we are just so excited about that. Now I need you to join me in praying. My son-in-law get a job in Jackson, Mississippi so I can have her all the time. That's my prayer right now. Um, but do you, just look at that face. Do you think there's ever gonna be a time when I tell her no? <laughs> Not a chance. That's what parents are for. Grandparents are not for saying no. But if, if she's with me and she asks me for something that's really, you know, not in her best interest, maybe she wants sugar right before bedtime, you know, or right before a meal. Or maybe she says, you know, Doc, can I go play out in the street or can I play by the open fire pit? I, I probably would tell her no. If she said, Doc, I want to watch a really scary movie, I'm for sure going to tell her no. Right now, now the question is, if I have to tell this precious angel, no, does that mean I don't love her? Does it make me a bad man? D do you think she's always going to understand why Doc sometimes has to say no? You think she's always going to understand? Probably not. Any chance y'all think she might get mad at me and pout a little bit about it? Probably so. But does it change the fact that I love her like crazy? Absolutely not. I love this little ball of love already, right? Now, the question becomes, for you and for me, have you ever thought that God looks at you the way I look at her? God looks at you the way we look at our children and grandchildren. Consider this verse in 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. It says, so see how great a love the Father has bestowed. I like the translation that actually says lavished. It's like God just pours out, lavishes love on us that we would be called children of God and such we are. You are a daughter of God. You're a son of God when you say yes to Jesus. And do you think your father now knows how to give you good things? You know he does. Matthew 7, 11 says like this. If you then being evil, that's us, if we know how to give good gifts to our children, how much more will your father in heaven who's not evil, how much will your father in heaven who is heaven give what is, everybody say that next word, good your Father in heaven will give what is good to those who ask him. God loves to give good things. And so many times we celebrate when God says yes to our prayers and yes to our, our requests of him and, and we see God move and it's amazing. But do you ever think God is gonna tell you no? Some problem you won't solve, some pain you want to go away, some person you won't heal or transformed is there a potential that the God who loves you would tell you no? And if he tells you no, does it mean that he doesn't love you? If, if he tells you no, does that mean that God's now bad? Does it mean that you're, you always are gonna understand why he says no? And is it possible that you might pout or get mad at God and, and call him bad names? And if you pout and get mad at God and call him bad names, do you think it changes the way he loves you? Not a chance. That's really what I want to talk with you about today is learning to trust God in the no, because God sometimes says no. He says no to a lot of people in the Bible. Moses asked God, can I go into the promised land? And God said, no, I'm sorry, you can't. David asked God to heal his infant son and later on asked God to be able to build a temple for God. And God said, no and no. I'm thinking about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who were told, if you don't bow down and worship this idol, you're going into the fiery furnace. And they wouldn't bow down. Do you think they asked God to spare them from the fiery furnace? Absolutely. And God said, no, I'm sorry, you're gonna have to go into it, but you're gonna go through it. I think about a man who had a legion of demons who met Jesus in a graveyard one day naked and out of his mind. And whenever Jesus healed him in an instant with the word because he is God among us, that man asked Jesus, can I go with you now? And Jesus said, I'm sorry, but no, you cannot. 
I think about Jesus himself who heard the Father say to him in the Garden of Gethsemane when Jesus is praying desperately to the Father, if there's any way, please let this cup of wrath, this cup of suffering pass from me. And the Father said, no. At one time or another, God's gonna tell all of us, no. So often you may hear, even in church, that if you'll just have faith, you can have anything you want. And sometimes you do need to have faith to see God move. But I want you to hear, I believe it takes just as much faith to trust God in the no. Because many times faith is not always getting from God what you want. Sometimes faith is accepting from God what he gives. That's why I asked you to find the book of 2 Corinthians today. We're gonna look at a time in the life of the Apostle Paul when God told him no. In the book of 2 Corinthians, just to give you a little bit of background, Paul had planted this church, he started this church, was there about 18 months, really poured into these people's lives, and then he left, he had other things he was going to do, other churches to plant, other things to to take care of, and when he left, there were false teachers who came in and started to undermine the work that Paul had done, and really started to undermine Paul himself, and so Paul is writing partly in 2 Corinthians to, to say, hey man, this is my credential, this is my resume, here's why you guys need to trust me when I tell you this is the the truth. And so he says, if these people are Jewish, please know they can't out Jewish me. Second Corinthians 11 verse 22. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they descendants of Abraham? So am I. I I'm just as much Jewish, the people of God as they are. And then he goes on to say, and if you're talking about being a servant of Jesus, I got them on that one too. Verse 23. Are they servants of Christ? He said, I speak like I'm insane. But I, so much more, I more so, in far many, this is, listen to the way Paul's life was as a follower of Jesus. In far more labors and far more imprisonments, beaten times without number, often in danger of death, five times I received from the Jews 39 lashes, three times I was beaten with rods, once I was stoned, three times I was shipwrecked, a night and a day I've spent in the deep, I've been on frequent journeys and dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my countrymen, dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers on the sea, dangers among the brethren, the false brethren. I've been in labor and hardship through many sleepless nights and hunger and thirst, often without food and cold and exposure. And apart from such things, there's this daily pressure on me of concern for all the churches. Who is weak without my being weak? Who's led into sin without my intense concern? How many of y'all want to live Paul's life? Anybody out there want to live Paul's life? Not me. I mean, I don't want that. That sounds miserable. So much pain, so much suffering in his following after Jesus. This man suffered deeply. That may be why God gave him something he gave to nobody else, at least not up to this time. He gave Paul an incredible vision of heaven. 2 Corinthians 12, verse two, Paul says, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, if you have your Bible open, underline 14 years ago, because what we're about to read, Paul didn't just figure out overnight, it took him about a decade and a half to finally get it. Listen to me, some things you don't understand right now, but in time, God's gonna show you. I know a man who 14 years ago, whether in the body, I don't know, or out of the body, I don't know, God knows, such a man was caught up into the third heaven. Now, what's the third heaven? Think about it this way. The first heaven is the sky where birds and airplanes and clouds are. The second heaven is what we would call the universe, stars and sun and moon, stuff like that. The third heaven is the presence of God, the dwelling of God. So he's caught up into the Third heaven, and I know how such a man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I don't know, God knows, was caught up into paradise. Same thing as the third heaven. The presence of God, paradise, the place of delight. And he heard inexpressible words which a man is not permitted to speak. Paul got this glimpse of paradise, of heaven, and the sights and the sounds were so amazing that he couldn't articulate it. Now, now you think, hey, I want to be like Paul. Man, give me visions like that. I want that. But hold that thought. Because the very next verse, chapter 12, verse 7 says, because of the surpassing greatness of the revelation. This, this revelation was so amazing. And Paul could easily get pumped up and think he was the man because he got something nobody else got. For this reason, to keep me from exalting myself. Right, that's why. To keep me from exalting myself, there was given me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan 
to torment me. Again, here's why. To keep me from exalting myself. Now concerning this, this thorn, this torment, I implored, I begged God three times. I don't think it means three prayers. I think it means in seasons of his life when it was especially difficult, weeks, months, in those seasons, three different seasons, he was begging God, the Lord, three times that it might leave me, God, take it away. And he said to me, no. Now the no's not in the text, it's implied because he says, my grace is sufficient for you. For power is perfected in weakness. And so Paul then writes, most gladly, therefore, I'll boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I'm well content, actually, with weaknesses, insults, distresses, and persecutions and difficulties for Christ's sake. For when I'm weak, that's when I'm strong. Paul had this thorn, this place of pain in his life, and he says it tormented him. The picture is of somebody just beating you down with a bare fist, beat, giving you a beat down regularly, knocking the life out of you. It torments him. He also calls it a messenger of Satan, someone or something straight from the pit of hell. Now, how could God allow that for one of his children? Well, maybe, maybe it would help you, as R.C.H. Linsky says in his commentary on this passage. He says, think about Job. I don't know if y'all remember the story of Job. Job's a righteous man, blameless, a very upright man. And in heaven, there's a conversation between God and the devil about Job. And the devil is saying to God about Job, that man only serves you because you bless him so much. And God says, no, that man just loves me for me, not for what I do for him. And the devil says, well, let me have my way with him and we'll see. And so God allows hard things to happen in Job's life through the devil's hands because God is convinced that Job's faith can handle it. God's purpose is to show God is strong and that Job is strong and Job's faith won't falter. The devil's plan is to make Job turn away from God. Now you gotta know, this same scenario is being played out right now over your life. There is a God who loves you and believes in you and is never gonna let anything come to you but that he won't help see you through that thing and help your faith in him to grow strong, to show you that your God is able. But there's a very real devil who's trying to get you even right now to turn your back on God and say, faith doesn't work, God's not good, he doesn't love me, I'm out. Right now. Paul says, this, this messenger of Satan is tormenting me. Now, what is the thorn? We don't know. I made a list of some of the best and worst guesses that, that people have. Um, some people say that thorn in the flesh was blasphemous thoughts, that Paul would just have these random crazy thoughts. Any of y'all ever have random crazy thoughts? I know I do. You're like, where does that, where is that coming from? No, 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 let me erase that out of my mind. But it sometimes can happen, can it? Some people say it was a seared conscience, a wounded conscience, he felt guilty. Um, some scholars believe Paul was married and ultimately divorced, and so maybe he lamented a failed marriage. Or maybe it was he thought back to his early years when he was persecuting Christians, and he actually presided over the murder of the first martyr, a man named Stephen, and he can't get the image out of his mind of that good man dying at his hand and direction. Maybe that's what it was, a guilty conscience. Or, or maybe it was, some people say, some people say it was sexual temptation. Again, Paul's a single man. In places like Corinth, Corinth was especially immoral. Sexuality was flaunted in every way. And so maybe, maybe that's what it was. Paul, as a single man, had to try to walk in purity through this godless place. Some people say that his thorn in the flesh were people. Haters, people who opposed him all the time, everywhere he went. Maybe it was the difficulties in his life and his experience in life and nothing ever came easy to Paul and everything seems to be against me. Anybody know what that feels like? It's just hard. Other people think that maybe Paul's thorn in the flesh was a sickness of some sort. Paul clearly had eye problems based on some of the things that he wrote in other letters. Some people think maybe it was migraines, malaria, ear trouble, sciatica, arthritis, brucellosis, to name a few, leprosy maybe. Other people think maybe the thorn was a nervous disorder, panic attacks, depression, epilepsy. 
I don't know what it was. Nobody knows what it was, and I think it's on purpose. I think God doesn't want you to know so that we all can relate and go, I know what it feels like to have a thorn. Come on, anybody got a thorn? Anybody got a place of pain in your life that you've been asking God to take away? We don't know what it was, but we know it was painful, and we know that Paul says, I don't want this anymore. Three seasons of his life, he's begging God to take it away. And to me, it's a reasonable request. Who wants to live in pain? Who wants to be tormented all the time? And to me, it's actually a righteous request. It's a messenger of Satan who's presuming, presumably keeping Paul from living his best life for God. I mean, come on, God, surely you can say yes to that. But God said no. And it wasn't, no, not now, because sometimes we as parents say that to our kids, not right now, and well, maybe later. It was just no. I'm sorry, it's my final answer. You're not gonna get around this one. You're not gonna get away from this one. You're just gonna have to walk through this one. No, it's not going away. How do you trust God when the answer is no? What's required of me to have that kind of faith? Well, as I've looked at the scripture and tried to meditate on what what was it in Paul's faith in God that let him keep going even when God didn't give him what he wanted? Now, please hear me. Paul's got tremendous faith. Paul had seen dead people raised to life again. It's not a matter of does Paul have faith. This is not about Paul at all. It's about God and God's goodness. And would Paul trust that? even when God didn't seem good. What's required of you to walk that road? Well, I think there are three requirements. The first one is this. You're you're gonna be required to believe God has a higher and better purpose. You may not understand what's going on or why, but you gotta believe God has a higher and a better purpose that I can't see. Sometimes we know why God said no. Sometimes it's a consequence of sin, okay? So Moses couldn't go in the promised land because he sinned. David didn't get to build the temple because he was a man of bloodshed. Sometimes God will, God will always forgive the guilt of your sin, but sometimes you still have to walk through the consequences of the dumb decisions you made. And God's not bad, he's not mad, he's not mean. It's just he'll love you through it. Sometimes we ask with wrong motives. James 4 says we just want selfish stuff and God's like, I'm not interested in that. Sometimes it's not time yet. John 9 tells about a man who was born blind, blind for 40 years. You know his parents, took him to church, prayed over him, had the elders cast out demons, anoint him with oil, all that stuff. Nothing ever worked until it was the time. But sometimes God says no because he has a higher purpose. No, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, I'm not going to spare you from the fire. I'm actually going to walk you through the fire so that king knows who's really in charge. And all these people thousands of years later will have a faith in a God who can see them through anything. He said no to the garrison demoniac, that man who had a a legion of demons cast out of him. He says, no, you're going to go back. You're going to have to go back to your own home because that's where you hurt people. And you abandoned them. And that man, that man went back and he led 10 cities to faith in Christ because of the power of his testimony. That was better than going with Jesus. And even Jesus, when he was told no about drinking the cup of wrath and suffering on the night he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, it was because God had a better yes. He's gonna save you and me and forgive us of our sins. God has a better yes. So why is the thorn given to Paul? What's the better? Yes, he told you two times, it's to keep Paul from exalting himself. This thorn kept Paul humble and dependent upon God. This pain actually protected Paul from Paul. Come on, anybody out there need protection from your dumb self? You know you do, because if it was up to you, you would do all sorts of stupid, right? And so sometimes God has to introduce circumstances into your life to humble you, to let you be reminded you're not really the man, and it actually presses you to God. God, I need you. Oh, God, I need you now. God, I need you now. Paul wants to get rid of the pain. He wants his life to be pleasant and pain-free, So he's saying, God, take away the pain, but Paul is prone to pride and God loves him too much. 
And God's opposed to proud people. The Bible says it in James 4, 6, he gives a greater grace. So it says God is opposed to the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And so God doesn't want to oppose Paul. He wants to help Paul. So the only way he can do that is to keep him humble. Would you rather, be honest, would you rather have no pain and problems in your life and yet you'd be far from God? Or would you rather experience pain and problems in your life and be close to God? Now, come on, be honest, because most of us would, it's Sunday school, I know, but a lot of us would say, I'd rather be pain free and just do my thing. But God says, if pain is required to keep you close to me, I can bring the pain. It's not what he wants to bring, but he can bring it if that's what it takes to keep you close to him, because that's what he really wants. When God says no, you have to have a trust in him that there's a reason, even if you don't know what it is, and I don't think God told Paul what the reason was for a long time. Remember, 14 years. I think initially Paul's like, this is stinking crazy, God. I don't know why you're doing this to me. I hate this, take it away, take it away, take it away. But sometimes in life, if y'all live long enough to be able to say in hindsight, <laughs> you know, as I look in the rear view mirror, I look back and go, wow, God was so good in that. It took Paul 14 years. But after 14 years, he could look back and go, you know what? God was so good to give me that thorn because he was protecting me from me. He was protecting me from me. Sometimes God's ways don't make sense and you don't understand it in the moment. You gotta anchor yourself in a couple of Bible verses. One of them is Isaiah 55, verse eight. Write it down. Isaiah 55, eight and nine. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. It's not that I don't want my granddaughter to watch scary movies. I don't want her to be afraid. My ways are different from what she can understand. I don't want images in her mind, sounds in her ear, right? Here's another verse, Romans 8, 28. It says, and we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. That verse doesn't say everything is good. It says even in the bad, God can bring good. But now look at the very next verse, verse 29. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. I don't believe verse 29 teaches that God predestines you to salvation or not to heaven or to hell that's wrapped up in foreknowledge he knows what we're going to choose he's all knowing but when he knows that you're going to say yes to God he predestines he has determined that everybody who is his is going to be like Jesus and he will do whatever it takes to make you become like Jesus Paul actually could see that this thorn pressed him to dependence upon God, which is what Jesus did. And so he saw it as a gift from God, not in the moment, but looking back, God never wasted a, a part of the pain. All of it pressed him to God. In the same way that Moses spent 40 years when he had killed a man in Egypt, he, he spent 40 years out in the wilderness, right? And then he goes back and he leads the children of Israel out of Egypt into the wilderness that he had been in for 40 years. Knew it like the back of his hand. In the same way that David, before he got to be the king, was a shepherd boy living out there in the pastures of Palestine. Why would God make him wait 17 years? Because whenever Saul was trying to kill David, David fled to Palestine and he knew every nook and cranny like the back of his hand. God didn't waste any of the pain. When I was a young kid, there was a young man named Roosevelt Poindexter who was, who was uh, in my class. And uh, Rosie and I went to junior high and high school together, but we were raised two completely different ways. Roosevelt's dad worked on cars, and so, like, worked in the yard on cars. Y'all you know what I'm talking about? Worked, in, worked on cars in the yard. And so when Rosie was a little bitty boy, his dad would have him moving cinder blocks, moving tires, eventually, you know, like helping pick up uh, engine blocks and stuff. And so Roosevelt, you know, Roosevelt was kind of a strong guy. Kids in my neighborhood, we were playing bike chase and watching Gilligan's Island. Come on, anybody know? 
That, that was kind of the way we were, we were raised up. I, I, was, I was raised up. If I wanted to lift weights, I used these weights that you put concrete in. Did anybody remember those weights you put concrete in? Come on, you get swole with those, right? But, but you never knew if they were the same exact weight. And so, you know, your right arm was bigger than your left and you had to swap it over, whatever. Roosevelt wasn't lifting that stuff. He was doing curls with, with car axles. I mean, this guy's just, he's massive. When we got to the ninth grade, I weighed 110 pounds. Roosevelt Poindexter weighed 220 pounds. He had a full beard, hair under his arm, and I think he was already going bald. I'm not sure. But what I'm trying to say to you is Roosevelt Poindexter was a grown man. And when you put him on defensive end, he could handle all of us little kids because his upbringing prepared him for the moment. I, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to make a point to say to you, there's nothing that God wastes. There's nothing that God wastes. And so if you're in it, please know God's got a purpose for it. You don't know what that is yet. It doesn't make sense to you. You keep asking God why and telling God please. But today God's saying to you, would you Trust me that my ways are higher than yours and they're better than yours. Can I ask you, are you moving toward that? Or are you still stuck at, God, I don't like it. Today, just start taking your step. God, help me to trust you. Help me to trust you more. Here's the second thing it's gonna require. It's gonna require you to lean on God's grace to make it through. Paul's problem is not say it solved by God taking away the pain. Paul's problem is solved by God adding something and he adds his grace. You're gonna have to learn to lean on God's grace to make it through. Paul says, whenever I was weak, I could call on God and he would give me the strength that I need. Look back at verse nine. He said to me, my grace is sufficient for you for power is perfected in weakness. So Paul says, most gladly, therefore, I would rather boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ might dwell in me. A better translation actually would be that the power of Christ might dwell on me. First of all, can I just say about this verse, I think it's amazing that Paul stops to listen for God. Because most of us, whenever we pray, we, we, act, we act like we're ordering at McDonald's. God, I want this and I want that and I want you to take that off and I don't want that now. add a little extra this. That's the way we talk to God. And please hear me, prayer is partly communicating what you desire to God, but that's half of prayer. The other half is you shutting your mouth and opening your heart to listen with a surrendered faith. God, what do you want? And God talked to him. God talked to him. And the first word God spoke to him was sufficient. Now, in our English translations, we try to make it make sense. My grace was sufficient for you. The first word in the Greek text is sufficient. Enough. Enough. More than enough. Adequate supply for you will be my grace. My undeserved favor, because all of us are sinners and none of us deserve God's goodness and kindness, but because of God's grace, his sufficient grace, that grace would include forgiveness. But it also, please hear me, it includes peace. It also includes comfort and support and strength and assurance and hope and joy. Paul, God says to Paul, Jesus says to him, sufficient will be my grace, my provision. This grace is gonna be stronger than your thorn and mightier than the messenger. This grace is gonna support you and protect you and every time you're attacked, I'm gonna protect you and see you through. This all sufficient grace all the way to the end, grace from God kept Paul from ever having to do things on his own. And as a consequence, listen to me, he endured what he didn't think he could endure. He was able to perform things he never thought he could perform. Why? Not because Paul was the man, but because he knew God's grace was his. And in that way, the thorn actually is a gift because the thorn kept him humble. And when he was humble, God made him strong. You ever experienced God sustain you like that? I have. I've been honest with you guys over the last few years, particularly just about my life journey and the highs and lows of that. And it's not always been easy. And so whether it's walking a road of depression or whether it is parting ways with some dear friends or whether it's been leading in times of hardship or crisis when I didn't know what I was doing, let alone how to tell you what to do. 
There have been times when I've wanted to quit. There have been times when I've cried and cried out to God and said, God, I can't do this. I don't want to do this anymore. And yet my testimony is God has always said sufficient for you will be my grace. Whatever I've needed, he's always supplied it. He didn't take away. He added. He didn't say yes. He said, I'm sorry, the answer's still no, but I'm going to be right there with you. I don't ever want to do it again. But I can look back and say, God, you've been faithful. Paul, on the other hand, actually says, not only do I look back at it and say, God, you've been faithful. He says, I actually now look at my present struggles and I rejoice when I have battles with hardship and weakness because it keeps me on my face. He says, it actually becomes like this tent over me when I'm weak. The power of Christ is, is strong over me, is what, it, it's, it's what it says. It's the picture of a tent. I'm covered by his tent. I've taught you it's like being under the umbrella of God's protection. A tent's a much better picture, probably, right, to see it because you're, you're covered on all sides. Actually, a better word, it's, it's this power of God that comes on me and covers me. The better picture in this generation may be a force field. I don't know what a force field is. Of course, all the... Everybody knows what a force field is, okay? <laughs> he says, whenever I'm humble and I say to God, I need you so bad, it's like the power of God just goes. <clears throat> is the enemy still there? Yep, he just can't get to me. The problem's still there? Yep, but I got strength on the inside. That's the picture I want you to see right now is because right now in the hell you're walking through, you need to trust that whenever you say, God, I need you, I can't do this. I need you. God says, but I can. I can handle it. I can handle it. Lean on God's grace and strength to see you all the way through. Paul says in verse 10, he said, therefore I'm actually well content with weaknesses, with insults, with distresses, and persecutions, with difficulties for Christ's sake, and that's important, for when I'm weak, that's when I'm actually strong. He says, I've learned to be well content. It's a Greek word that actually means this. It means it seems good to me. I'm actually, it's my pleasure. I don't know if Paul worked at Chick-fil-A or not, but he says, my pleasure. <laughs> now listen, this idea, it, it's, it's well-pleasing, it seems good to me, I, I'm, I'm well content. It's the same word that God the Father says about Jesus the Son at his baptism on the mountain of transfiguration when he says, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well-pleased. Same word. Paul didn't like weakness and insults and distresses, distresses and persecutions and difficulties for the heck of it, he's not a masochist. He said, when it's for Christ's sake, when I'm following Christ and the road that he asked me to walk is not what I've chosen on my own, I'm choosing to trust he's with me. And so now I, he's proven himself over and over so much that actually I can say, whatever you got, devil, bring it on. My God is able. He's experiencing what James said in James 4, 6. Remember, we read this verse a minute ago, but he gives a greater grace. Therefore, it says God's opposed to the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. God was letting that thorn come, so Paul would stay humble, but look at the rest of it. Submit, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, he will draw near to you. Verse 10 goes on to say, humble yourself in the presence of the Lord, and he will exalt you. So here's what I'm trying to say to you. Listen to me. When the answer's no, when the answer's no, and you don't understand why it's no, but it's no, he's not repairing the relationship, he's not healing the sickness, he's not fill in the blank. When the answer is no, when you acknowledge that you are nothing and you cannot handle what life is throwing at you on your own and you confess, Jesus, I need you, this scripture said God draws near to you the enemy is kept at bay and Christ says, I'll lift you up. I'll see you through. Lean on his sufficient grace. Here's the last requirement. If you're gonna have faith through the hell you're walking through, through God's no, through the pain, it requires you to acknowledge you're not home yet, but one day you will be. 
Right? This is what's required. It's, re it's required for you to say, I'm not home yet. This is my mindset. I'm not home yet, but one day I will be. I don't know about you, but I need a finish line. Right? If, you're, if you can give me something hard to do, but it's gotta be a finish line. Five o'clock's quitting time. Come on, can I get a holler? Right? At five o'clock, that's done. Right, we're going home. By the end of the day, we're going home and it's over with. If you'll tell me there's an end to it, I can endure it. When I was in seminary, Christy and I would say to each other, we're in a parenthesis. We started this thing, we're gonna close this thing off so we can live in the pain and poverty of it until we close it off. When I've done endurance events, part of what lets me keep going is knowing there's a finish line and rest on the other side. I'm just about to pay one more semester for my son to go to college. College. Come on, somebody give me an amen. Now, whenever you get them kids start to be paid for, I don't know if that ever happens actually, but, but when you see an end, a light at the end of the tunnel, it's like, yes, I can do this for a little bit longer. So here's my question to you. Is there a finish line for your suffering and pain? Because if you don't believe there's a finish line, it's hard to keep going, isn't it? But if you believe there's a finish line, you can say, I think I'll do it again. I think I can keep going because I know the end is coming. God gave Paul this glimpse of the finish line that Paul says was so unbelievable, this third heaven paradise, so unbelievable, can't even put it into words. And I think that, that glimpse of the finish line is what let Paul keep living through hardship every day. This wasn't forever. This is for now. He's not home yet. There's not just an end. As I was thinking about praying about God, what are you saying? What are you saying to me? What are you saying to us? There's not just an end to difficulty, to pain, to, to, to Satan's message and messengers. There's not just an end. There's actually a reversal that's coming. I was led to think about Luke chapter 16. Maybe you remember a story that Jesus told about a very rich man who'd had no problems in life. He lived large, best clothes, best house, best neighborhood, best vacations. Everything was awesome, never any pain. And another man named Lazarus, who was a beggar, sick all the time, laid at his gate of the rich man, just begging for alms, begging for a handout, dogs licking his sores. You couldn't have gotten more opposite in life. And then they both die. And Lazarus, the poor man, who's had his whole life has been filled with pain, is actually in Abraham's bosom. It's called paradise, the third heaven. He's in the place now where it is on like a chicken bone. And the rich man goes to hell. And he's in agony and torment. And so Jesus says, in Luke 20, 16, verse 25, it says, this, this rich man lifts up his eyes from hell and he says to Abraham, help me. And Abraham said, child, remember that during your life, you got good things. And likewise, Lazarus, bad things, but now, but now he's being comforted here. And you're in agony. You know, one of the things that makes it really hard to endure in faith is when you look around and you see unrighteous people with no pain and no problems, isn't it? We're not home yet. The apostle John got a glimpse of heaven too, and yet he could articulate it for us. If you're in the midst of it right now, would you just think about this finish line that's one day coming? Revelation 21, verse one. John writes, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth passed away and there was no longer any sea and I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband and I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, behold, the tabernacle of God is among men and he will dwell among them and they shall be his people and God himself will be among them and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes and there will be no longer any death, no longer any mourning or crying or pain. Those things have passed away. There was a finish line for that and he who sits on the throne says, behold, I am making all things new. And he said, right, for these words are faithful and true. Then he said to me, it's done. I'm the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of the water of life without cost. He who overcomes. Amen. He who stays in faith 
when life is hard. He who overcomes will inherit these things and I will be his God and he will be my son. Sometimes in the middle of your pain and the pressure and the problems of this broken world that feels so overwhelming and discouraging, you need to remember miracle faith too. God's coming one day. He's gonna make all things right and new and his goodness is gonna consume all things. Jesus said in John 14, don't let your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it weren't so, I would have told you so. But I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'm gonna come again and receive you to be with me that where I am there, you may be also. That's when you'll be home. That's when you'll be home. But for now, Will you just say, I'm not home yet, but I will be. Can I take us back to where we started? I could look at that all day, couldn't (laughs) y'all? What's up, baby girl? She's watching right now in Dallas, Texas. She is beautiful and amazing and I love her, but she's got a problem. She's selfish. (laughs) she doesn't care that my daughter hasn't slept or she's tired. She's not worried about her daddy being able to provide for her. She just needs new food and new diapers, right? She doesn't care that you can hear her crying, whatever. It's all about her right now. And our prayer for this sweet, precious angel is that as she grows up, she's gonna grow into God and recognize that life's not all about her, life's all about him. And when life's all about him, you take the focus off of you and you actually can love and serve other people. Paul wrote it like this in 1 Corinthians 13, I think around verse 11, he says, when I was a child, I used to speak like a child and think like a child and reason like a child, but when I became a man, I did away with childish things. So here's what I'm saying to you right now. In the midst of, God, I don't want this pain. God, I don't want this problem. God, you gotta fix this, solve this. You're not good if you don't do what I say. You sound like my granddaughter. It's all about you. And I'm asking you today, are you ready to grow up? To take a step in your faith journey where you say, God, I'm gonna trust you even when your answer seems to be no. I'm gonna trust that you have a higher plan and a better way and God, your grace is gonna be enough for me and I'm not home yet. Come on, you gotta have miracle faith that believes God can do anything and change anybody, but you gotta have a Monday faith that says, God, I just wanna keep my head down, mind my own business, do the things you've given me to do, love people well, work real hard for you and God, trust that though I may be like Ruth and never see a miracle in my life, God, I may be the miracle. That's what God invites you to. We're gonna end the series of teaching. We're gonna end this message today by taking communion. And so if you didn't get a communion packet on your way in, you can raise your hand and and one of my friends will will get you a communion packet. If you're at home, you can make your preparation now. But but here's what what I wanna do. I'm gonna pray and then we're gonna have a moment to just reflect. But here's what I want you to think about when you think about this piece of bread that reminds you that God loved you enough to send his own son. That's what the bread represents. God became a sinless person for you and me. And that cup of juice reminds you that it wasn't enough for him just to be sinless. He became a sacrifice and shed his blood so that you and I could be forgiven. He laid down his life, was laid in a tomb, and on the third day was raised to life again by the power of God. That's miracle faith. And he says, I'm going to heaven, and one day I'm gonna come again for you. Okay, that's what is represented in what you hold. Okay, so here's what I want you to think. I want you to think about while you're holding communion. This is what it represents. It says to you, Jesus is actually the beginning of my life. If I don't have Jesus, I don't have spirit life. Y'all with me? I don't have forgiveness. I don't have spiritual life. I'm separated from God apart from Christ. Jesus is the beginning of this. And he's the center of my life. That what you're walking through right now is not about you. 
Your, your prayer by taking communion is to say, Jesus, I want you to be glorified in my life and in my living and in my choices. Be my strength. I want to have miracle faith and Monday faith all, all day long. And Jesus, you're the goal of my faith. 1 Corinthians 11 says, when you take communion, you proclaim his death until he comes. You're saying, I'm not home yet. I'm not home yet. And God, I want to be faithful and have faith until you come for me. Do you do that? I'm going to pray for us. We're going to have a moment to reflect and then I and our campus leaders will come back and lead you to eat and drink together. Come on, let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for your grace. It's more than enough. Without you, we're nothing. But God, with you, we have everything that we need. And so, Lord, for my brothers and sisters right now who are walking through pain, hardship, heartache, difficulty, and it just seems like the devil's just beating us down, God, today we lift our eyes to you to say we are overcomers through you, Jesus. Jesus, you speak a better word, and you're never going to leave us nor forsake us. And so, God, we ask you to build our faith and trust. We worship you now in Christ's name. Amen.